Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about America's foreign policy between the two world wars, specifically the years 1919 and 1941. There's a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. Uh, you know, the most important thing to understand about America's foreign policy during this time period was that it was primarily characterized by isolationism. Beginning in 1920, Americans instinctively began to pull away from foreign interventions and instead turn their attention to what was happening within their own country. Now, the main cause of the rise of isolationism in America was the end of World War I. Americans have bought into the belief that the war was being fought to make the, Amer make the world safe for democracy. A massive mobilization effort had sent over 4 million American men to fight in the trenches of Europe. And in the process, America had become deeply embedded in European affairs for the first time in its history. In less than two years of fighting, the United States suffered over 320,000 casualties. And the peace negotiations that followed were viewed by many as a failure. Most of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points have been left out of the Treaty of Versailles, and the treaty itself seemed more intent on punishing the central powers than creating a lasting peace. In the end, the United States not only failed to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, but it also refused to join the League of Nations, an international organization that Woodrow Wilson had helped to create. To Americans, the entire escapade had been a major foreign policy blunder, one that they had no intention of repeating. And so they retreated back to their side of the world, falsely believing that the Atlantic Ocean would provide them with protection from any outside threats. So we see this isolationist mood play out in a number of events in the 1920s. In the election of 1920, Warren Harding campaigned on a return to normalcy, which was a direct rebuke of Wilson's interventionist approach to foreign policy. Under the Republican presidents of the 1920s, the United States military would return to a state of unpreparedness, and they would erect walls to further isolate themselves from the rest of the world. A good example of this was the tariff hikes that occurred throughout the decade. In 1922, Congress passed the Ford B. McCumber Tariff Law, which increased the taxes on imported goods. This tariff, as well as the later Howley Smoot Tariff, were designed to protect American businesses by creating barriers to international trade. Now, in 1922, the United States hosted the Washington Naval Conference, which sought to disarm world powers. Out of the conference came the Five Power Naval Treaty, which set limits on the navies of some of the major world powers at the time. Under the Five Power Treaty, countries such as the United States, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan would scrap plans to build battleships and aircraft carriers in order to avoid a future arms race. The plan reflected America's isolationism because it would allow the United States to cut spending on its Navy and encourage other countries to do likewise. The United States also helped negotiate the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928. The Kellogg-Briand Pact outlawed all wars of aggression. The pact was a noble idea designed to maintain peace, but the problem was that it had no way of actually enforcing what it wanted to do. The Washington Naval Conference and the Kellogg-Briand Pact both reflected America's rejection of interventionism abroad because America was trying to seek influence in world events without any of the financial and military commitments that came along with them. So the outbreak of the Great Depression in 1929 significantly destabilized the international community. Before the stock market crashed, the United States had set up a system of paying back war debts accrued during World War I called the Dawes Plan. Now, under the Dawes Plan, the United States would invest money in Germany, which in turn would help them pay back war, repara war reparations to Great Britain and France. Great Britain and France could then use those reparations to pay down some of the debt that they borrowed from the United States during World War I. However, when the stock market crashed, American credit to Germany dried up and the cycle of financial payments ground to a halt. The economies of Europe, which had been struggling since World War I to begin with, collapsed, and many European countries experienced high rates of unemployment and homelessness. These economic strains placed on countries around the world led to the rise of totalitarian governments. In Italy, Benito Mussolini established a totalitarian dictatorship where unemployment and inflation produced bitter strikes. Mussolini created the Fascist Party, which seized control of Italy in 1922. Joseph Stalin had consolidated power in the Soviet Union by 1929, and by the 1930s had begun to purge the country of all dissidents, sentencing many to death and banishing others to work camps. And in Germany, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party came to power in 1933, promising to restore the country to its former glory. The rise of authoritarian regimes was not just a European phenomenon either. In Japan, military generals increasingly exerted influence over the government, and Emperor Hirohito looked to expand Japan's power in the Pacific. 
All of these dictators practiced an extreme form of nationalism that demanded complete subordination to the state. A big part of this nationalism involved building up the country's military and aggressively pursuing the acquisition of new territories. So the events that led to World War II began with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Japan quickly, quickly seized the area and then cut off the region from trade with other countries. The action not only violated the open door policy, but also the kellogg Grand Pact and international agreements set up by the League of Nations. Countries around the world were outraged by Japanese aggression, but few countries, including the United States, were willing to take serious steps to stop it. The invasion of Manchuria exposed not only the inability of the League of Nations and the United States to prevent international hostilities, but it also emboldened other dictators who wanted territory of their own. In 1935, Mussolini invaded Ethiopia in order to begin building a new Roman Empire. And a year later, Italy allied with Nazi Germany to create the Rome-Berlin Axis, or more simply, the Axis powers. For Americans, the Great Depression only deepened isolationist sentiment, and most Americans became more focused on solving the economic crisis than worrying about what the, was happening with the rise of dictators overseas. For example, when the London Economic Conference was organized in 1933 to stabilize world currency rates and find international solutions to the Depression, FDR refused to participate, worrying that international cooperation might interfere with some of the programs being created by the New Deal. Roosevelt also withdrew the United States from Asia. In the context of the Great Depression, many Americans saw the lands acquired by the United States during the era of imperialism as a financial liability. Therefore, Congress passed the Tidings-McDuffie Act in 1934, which granted the Philippines its independence by 1946. The Tidings-McDuffie Act was not so much a noble gesture on the part of America as it was an attempt by the U.S. to free themselves of the financial costs associated with maintaining control over the Philippines. Other countries took notice of America's actions in Asia, and Japan now calculated the United States would not pose a major challenge to their plans for expansion. In 1937, the Japanese government would therefore launch a full invasion of China and continue to expand their territory in the Pacific, leading all the way up to World War II. Now, isolationism also impacted the development of new policies in the United States regarding Latin America. Even as the United States had attempted to detangle itself from European affairs in the 1920s, it had still been active in Latin America, using the Roosevelt Corollary to justify numerous military actions. For example, American troops remained in Haiti throughout the 1920s, and President Coolidge sent 5,000 troops into Nicaragua in 1926. These interventions had led to bitter feelings between the United States and many countries in the Western Hemisphere. As dictators seized territory in Europe and Asia, it was more important than ever that the United States build a strong relationship with neighboring countries in order to protect itself. The result was the good neighbor policy, which renounced armed intervention in the affairs of Latin American countries. Under the good neighbor policy, FDR freed Cuba from the restrictions placed on it by the Platt Amendment and withdrew American troops from Haiti and Nicaragua. Through the good neighbor policy, the relationship between the United States and countries to the South began to finally improve. Now, for most of the 1930s, America believed that the problems of Europe and Asia did not concern them, and Congress attempted to legislate the issue with a series of neutrality acts, which were passed between 1935 and 1937. Under these acts, no American could legally sail on a belligerent ship, sell or transport weapons to a country at war, or make loans to a country at war. In passing the Neutrality Acts, the United States was abandoning many of the principles that had driven them to get involved in World War I. Not only was America no longer willing to fight for neutrality of the high seas, but was also deserting the idea of moral diplomacy. See, the Neutrality Acts did not distinguish between aggressor nations like fascist Italy and Nazi Germany and victims like Ethiopia or the many other countries that would eventually come under attack by the Axis powers. By not making this distinction, the United States was abandoning its commitment to a democratic world. But many Americans wanted peace at any price and were willing to kind of accept those terms. So now the road to the to World War II was going to greatly accelerate. And that acceleration begins in 1938 when Hitler began to expand in Europe. In March of that year, Hitler occupied Austria and then attempted to take over the Sudetenland, which was a German-speaking area of Czechoslovakia. Europe responded with the Munich Agreement in September of 1938, which was designed to appease Hitler and end Nazi aggression. The world hoped that granting Hitler the Sudetenland would end hostilities and avoid war. 
Any hopes that appeasement would satisfy Hitler, however, were almost immediately dashed when six months after the Munich Agreement, Nazi Germany invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia. So Hitler shocked the world again when he signed the non-aggression pact with Stalin in 1939. The Hitler-Stalin pact was a treaty in which Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union pledged not to fight one another. The treaty essentially opened the door for Germany to invade Eastern European countries. And on September 1st, 1939, German tanks rolled into Poland, officially marking the beginning of World War II. So the United States struggled with these overseas developments. Americans were overwhelmingly opposed to Hitler and Nazism, but they clung to their isolationist tendencies. Franklin Roosevelt realized the danger that Hitler and other dictators posed to the United States and the world long before a lot of other Americans. And as early as 1937, he began to gradually get the United States more involved in world affairs. When war broke out in 1939, France and Great Britain desperately needed American supplies. However, the neutrality acts that had previously been passed prevented the United States from, from providing assistance. In response, FDR pushed the United States to pass a new law, the Neutrality Act of 1939, which sometimes is referred to as cash and carry. Under cash and carry, any country was allowed to buy American war goods if they transported them on their own ships and paid for them in cash. While technically neutral, cash and carry primarily benefited Great Britain and France since their navies controlled the Atlantic Ocean at that time. In the spring of 1940, Hitler unleashed the German Blitzkrieg on Western Europe, quickly overrunning Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Most shocking of all was the surrender of France that same summer. With the defeat of France, Great Britain was now at, um, all that stood in the way of Hitler's domination of the European continent. The defeat of Great Britain would not only represent the end of democratic government in Europe, but would also give Germany control of the Atlantic Ocean, putting American security directly in jeopardy. The defeat of France and the subsequent Battle of Britain shocked most of the American public out of their state of isolationism. The United States now moved quickly to build up its own military and provide support to Great Britain. To prepare for war, the United States passed the Selective Training and Service Act in 1940, which was the first ever peacetime draft in U.S. history. The United States also allocated $37 billion to rebuild its Navy and expand its Air Force. In September 1940, FDR authorized the transfer of 50 U.S. destroyers to Great Britain in exchange for strategic bases. The destroyers for bases deal was far from neutral and provided much needed ships to Great Britain, but it still did not go far enough to stop Nazi Germany. FDR pushed the country to go even further in the fight against Hitler. And so in March of 1941, the country passed the Lend-Lease Act. Under the Lend-Lease Act, the U.S. finally abandoned its neutrality and began to openly provide support for countries fighting against the Axis powers. Essentially, the United States became, as FDR put it, the arsenal of democracy, sending a limitless supply of arms to Great Britain and then later the Soviet Union, who would also wage war against Nazi Germany. The act was an economic declaration of war, and the operation ended up sending $50 billion worth of arms and equipment to allies by the end of World War II. Of course, the shift away from isolationism had a number of detractors within the United States. Most notably was the America First Committee, which was organized in 1940. The America First Committee argued that the United States should concentrate its efforts on building up its own defenses. And many of them still believed that the Atlantic Ocean could protect America against Nazi aggression. However, any arguments for isolationism were ended on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese bombed the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. Tensions had been building between the United States and Japan since the invasion of China, but the United States had been hesitant to take any serious action to stop Japanese expansion. That changed in 1940 when the United States imposed an embargo on Japanese supplies, cutting them off from the steel, scrap iron, and oil that they needed to continue to fight. The embargo put pressure on the Japanese government, who decided to go to war with the United States rather than relinquish control of China. Japan had joined the Axis powers in 1940, and now they looked to deal the United States a crippling blow before the, before the United States could mobilize its forces. The attack on Pearl Harbor caused the U.S. Congress to declare war on Japan. A few days later, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. For Americans, World War II had officially begun. Take care.